In a world saturated with images of success, beauty, and an idealized life version of whatever that is that we desire, it's easy to fall into the trap of comparison. We measure ourselves against ourselves, whether it's their achievements, their relationships, their spiritual progress, and we often come up short. But beyond comparing ourselves to others, there is a more subtle and equally destructive form of comparison, the comparison with an idealized version of ourselves. This subtle sin is not just a social or psychological issue, but deeply spiritual. It reveals a misunderstanding of who we are in light of God's truth, and it can lead to a form of, of self-righteousness that ensnares us into an exhausting cycle of shame and dissatisfaction. The solution is not found in working harder to be better, but in resting in the grace of God and the finished work of Christ. Paul warns us about the dangers of comparison in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, where he says, those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, at first glance, this may seem like a straightforward admonition against comparing ourselves to others. Yes, true. But it applies to all forms of comparison, anyone who is comparing themselves one of the most insidious ways that we compare is with our imagined version of who we think that we should be. You see the duality of the same individual here. This is who I think that I am, and that's who I wish I was. Many of us create a mental picture of the better self, the person who is more successful, more spiritual, more lovable. We place this ideal self on a pedestal and, and from this lofty view, we look down on this person that, that we are now. This lens creates a self-imposed hierarchy where we never measure up, leading to a constant sense of failure and inadequacy. This cycle only deepens our sense of shame and dissatisfaction with who we are. This self-comparison Though subtle, is a form of self-righteousness. When we think of self-righteousness, we usually imagine someone who feels superior to others. However, there is another side to it, a more inward-focused version, where we elevate the person we think we should be and condemn ourselves for not living up to that lofty standard. This perspective is just as dangerous because it focuses on our ability, our performance, our worthiness rather than Christ's finished work. We want to get there so we can feel better about ourselves, and that is the subtlety of self-righteousness. Whether we compare ourselves to others or an idealized version of ourselves, we look to something other than Christ to define our value and identity. The reality is far more humbling than than even our worst self-comparison. Think about the reality. The hard truth for all of us is that we are far worse than we imagine. You might see yourself here and you have an idealized version of what you want to be and you feel that sense of shame. The reality is far more humbling because we are far worse than we ever thought we could be. Our sins run deeper than we are often willing to acknowledge we're not just imperfect versions of ourselves down here in mediocrity. We are totally depraved sinners. As Paul makes clear throughout his letters, this biblical worldview might seem discouraging, but it is a truth that leads us to the most liberating news of all. Christ came for sinners, utterly helpless, broken, and rebellious people who can never save themselves or live up to any ideal, whether external or internal. This truth is vital to grasp because it shifts our focus from self-improvement to Christ dependence. Our constant striving to become a better version of ourselves, to win approval from God or others, is exhausting. And it's rooted in a false understanding of the gospel. We mistakenly believe that we need to reach a certain level of righteousness or personal holiness to be accepted by God. But the gospel tells us the opposite. 
Christ's love for us was not dependent upon our ability to improve. It was rooted in his desire to save us precisely because we could not save ourselves. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love to us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. True rest, the kind of rest that Jesus invites us into, is found not in striving to become our best selves, but in recognizing that Christ has already secured our standing before God. The approval that we long for, whether from God or for others, has been fully and completely given to us through Christ. This perspective means we no longer need to compare ourselves with others or to compare ourselves to the ideal version of ourselves that we have in our minds. We are free to be honest about our sins and our weaknesses because Christ has already dealt with them on the cross. His grace covers all our failures and shortcomings, and His righteousness defines us, not our own. The comparison trap is ultimately a distraction from the greater truth of the gospel. It keeps our eyes fixed on ourselves, our perceived successes or failures, rather than on Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. As long as we are caught in this cycle, we will never experience the freedom that comes from fully resting in the grace of God. But we find a deep and lasting peace when we shift our focus from who we think we should be to who Christ is and what he has done for us. In Christ, we're no longer defined by comparison, by others, by our standards. We're defined by his love, his sacrifice, his grace, the gospel. This truth frees us from the exhausting cycle of striving for approval and allows us to rest in the knowledge that we are fully loved and accepted by God, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. And that is where true joy and, and satisfaction are found.